Welcome to Comic Tropes, I'm your host Chris. In the modern day, we can find superhero movies, clothing, and toys pretty much everywhere we look. Marvel and DC, the publishers of those superheroes, things like Superman, Batman, Spider-Man, Wolverine, you know what I'm talking about, are licensed like crazy. And the publishers are turning a pretty healthy profit these days on their comics as well. So, it is wild to look back at a point in time when each of these publishers was willing to sell off their assets for what we now know today would have been pennies on the dollar. But that's exactly what we're going to talk about today, and it all begins with an explosion. The explosion I'm referring to was a DC Comics marketing term for their 1978 expansion of titles. In the 1970s, DC had lost a lot of market share to Marvel Comics. To combat this, Warner Publishing, who was the parent company of DC, hired a new publisher in 1975. President Bill Sarnoff hired Jeanette Kahn as publisher, and from 75 through 78, DC introduced an astonishing 57 new titles. Some of these books would be double length to give a backup story to characters, and some books would be 80 pages for a dollar. They also made some comics based on TV shows, including some that were adapting their comics, like Captain Marvel and Super Friends. New superhero books would include things like Firestorm and Black Lightning. DC also launched a bunch of fantasy titles. DC formally marketed this expansion as the DC Explosion, for their titles in June, July, and August of 1978, as they increased the page count of their monthly books from 17 to 25, and the cover price from 35 to 50 cents. To make a long story short, the marketing plan did not work. It was just more titles than there was talent to back it up. Another extenuating factor was a massive winter storm season from late 1977 into early 1978. The infamous Blizzard of 78, for example, claimed 54 lives and shut down distribution across the East Coast in February. But the fact was, these new books weren't selling, and Warner executives gave Khan the order to cut the line to just 26 titles. 20 of them would be the 50 cent monthly books, and 6 would be $1 bi-monthly titles. Even older books like All-Star Comics weren't safe, though its next issue ended up a backup comic in Adventure Comics number 461. And relatively popular books like Batman Family got cancelled, though it was technically merged with Detective Comics, which was selling worse, but was DC's second longest running book, so a lot of staff fought for it to continue for legacy reasons. The massive cuts to titles would come to be informally called the DC Implosion, and the last employees in at DC would be the first ones let go, like editors Al Milgram and Larry Hama. A lot of artwork had already been completed, of course, since these cuts came so quickly. Some of these ended up being printed as backup stories in existing books but a lot of them were only printed in a very rare, ultra-limited print run on a two-issue series called Cancelled Comics Cavalcade. That title is a riff on the Golden Age DC title Comics Cavalcade, which would feature characters like Wonder Woman, Flash, and Green Lantern. There were only about 35 copies printed on a printer in the DC offices in black and white. These books were printed for the creators of the comics, and some copies were sent to the U.S. Copyright Office and the Overstreet Comic Book Price Guide. This is called an ash can in comics terms, and exists solely to secure copyright. When we look at the chart of semi-monthly sales from the late 70s into the 80s, we see that DC continued to trail behind Marvel, and by 1982, Marvel began a steady uptick while DC continued to decline. So, perhaps it's at least understandable why DC reached out to Marvel in 1984 in a somewhat desperate bid to survive. To set up this next stage, we're going to learn from the personal blog of Jim Shooter, a writer, artist, and most germane to this episode, an editor in comics. In 1976, he started at Marvel as an assistant editor, but by 1978, he was actually made the editor-in-chief. And I've made an episode about Jim Shooter's accomplishments. It's a fascinating story. 
that's a cool episode worth watching, of course. Uh, but for the purposes of this episode, what's important to know is that he turned things around for Marvel sales-wise. Marvel started doing very well with their comic book sales, and DC Comics, their closest competitor, took notice. According to Jim Shooter, in February of 1984, he was contacted by Warner Publishing President Bill Sarnoff, asking if Marvel would be interested in licensing their characters to make new comic books. As in, Warner made plenty of money licensing Batman, Superman, and others for things like movies and merchandise, but they weren't turning a profit on the actual comics, while Marvel was. So, DC was interested in potentially turning over the comics to their biggest competitor. Shooter took the idea to Marvel's president, Jim Galton, who took it on himself to instantly call Sarnoff back and tell him that Marvel had no interest. Shooter was stunned, asking why he would pass on this opportunity, to which Galton allegedly said that if DC couldn't turn a profit with their characters, they must not be very good characters. Shooter wrote about this, saying, quote, Trying not to sound too crazed, I explained that they were great characters and that the DC editorial people were, frankly, doing a pretty poor job with them and that we could do better, a lot better. I talked him into calling Sarnoff back and telling him we'd give it some thought, end quote. Shooter put together a business plan, pitching the idea that Marvel would initially launch with seven titles based on DC characters. Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, Green Lantern, Teen Titans, Justice League, and the Legion of Superheroes. His research showed that they could expect to sell 39 million copies in year one and make a pre-tax profit of $3.5 million. Very healthy revenue for the 1980s. Galton was still skeptical, but a meeting with the other vice presidents of the company, including Ed Shukin from Circulation, revealed that they were confident they could do double what Shooter was projecting. So DC was ready to get out of the comics business and hand over their characters to Marvel, their biggest competition. Marvel was confident that they could turn a big profit. So why didn't this deal happen? Well, there was another separate event going on in 1984 that scuttled the deal. Independent publisher First Comics launched a lawsuit against the printers known as World Color Press. Their lawsuit alleged that World Color Press was the only printer using the so-called letterpress method that they wanted to use, but World Color Press was not charging First Comics the same prices that they charged Marvel and DC. It was an anti-competitive lawsuit that potentially called out Marvel as a monopoly in the industry. Jim Shooter wrote in his blog that one test of anti-competitive market dominance is having 70% of the market. At the time, Marvel had over 69% of market share. If they were to take over DC's 18%, it would be tough to argue against this lawsuit. So, Marvel declined DC's offer to license their characters and walked away. Within two years, DC would begin to make huge strides in the industry with big sales on books like Teen Titans, Dark Knight Returns, and Watchmen. But none of that would have happened in a world where World Color Press gave First Comics the rates that they wanted. Then there would have been no lawsuit, there would have been an excellent chance that Marvel would have gobbled up DC, and DC would have stopped existing as we know it today. All right, thank you all for being here at this Warner Brothers meeting. Now, the purpose of this meeting is to determine what storyline we should use to adapt for the next Batman movie. Now, I know a lot of you thought that we should have hired one of these up-and-coming writers like Mr. Alan Moore or Mr. Frank Miller, but of course, they've never written a Batman story before. So, in my opinion, we should use the latest popular Marvel story written by one Mr. Bill Mantlo. Yes, the guy who writes Rom Space Night and Micronauts. It's called Batman Blood Wars, and in it, Batman uses his new radioactive bat blood powers to fight Mr. Paste Pot Pete. I think it'll be a hit. Thoughts? So, that's the closest that DC Comics came to ceasing to exist as we know it today. Let's move over to Marvel's story now. In brief, Marvel was purchased in 1989 by a wealthy dude named Ron Perlman. Not the guy who played Hellboy. This one bought and sold companies like Revlon. 
He bought Marvel for $82.5 million and began aggressive plans of expanding the number of titles, raising the cover prices, and buying related companies like Fleer Trading Cards and Toy Biz. In the early 90s, Marvel was feeding the new speculation frenzy as new readers bought issue one of new titles or gimmick covers, thinking of it as an investment. Marvel's 1992 annual report was issued as a comic book to shareholders and features Doctor Strange flying around the Marvel Universe getting all sorts of good news on Marvel's growing revenues from characters like Quasar and War Machine. But it couldn't last. Speculators realized that they couldn't flip a quick profit, and 1993 featured a massive collapse in the comics industry. Company stock that was worth $35.75 a share as 1993 began fell to a pitiful $2.38 by 1996. Cut to another super rich dum dum named Ike Perlmutter. He was a huge shareholder in Toy Biz and he planned to buy the remaining shares of that company and merge it with Marvel, taking over. Perlman resisted by having Marvel declare bankruptcy so that the company could restructure, but ultimately, Perlmutter succeeded. Still, Marvel was struggling as he took over. Marvel turned the corner financially in 1999 when they hired an executive named Peter Cuneo to serve as both the CEO and chief financial officer. He enacted a number of cost-cutting measures and expanded focus on licensing their characters that began to turn things around within three years. Marvel would continue to become financially more and more healthy and eventually was sold to Disney in 2009 for $4 billion. But just before Cuneo was able to turn things around, Marvel made some very questionable financial decisions. In fact, saying questionable is probably putting it nicely. Uh, stupid and short-sighted might be more accurate. Marvel had gone on a licensing spree to get some cash during its early bankruptcy period. They sold Hulk to Universal Pictures, the X-Men and Fantastic Four to 20th Century Fox, and Blade to New Line Cinema. But these were bad deals. For example, Blade, which came out in 1998, made $70 million. But Marvel only earned $25,000 of those revenues. The X-Men, some of Marvel's best-selling characters, were sold to 20th Century Fox for a measly $2.6 million, according to a 2001 court filing. About $1 million for the animated rights for TV, and another $1.6 for live-action film rights. Marvel was then entitled to 2% of the back-end profits off of the movies worldwide, which meant they earned about $6 million off of the first X-Men movie. Despite movies like X-Men and Spider-Man being big hits, Marvel was seeing very little of that profit, and Cuneo helped guide Marvel into a somewhat risky deal to make their own movies. Obviously, the Marvel Cinematic Universe paid off massively, but Marvel had to take a dangerous path to get there. They launched Marvel Studios with a $525 million loan from Merrill Lynch, and if their first movies weren't a hit, Merrill Lynch would permanently get 10 of Marvel's properties that were put up as collateral. We're talking about some pretty important characters like Captain America, Doctor Strange, and Black Panther, among others. So the MCU worked, but let's jump back to 1998. Sony Pictures was talking with Marvel about buying the film rights to Spider-Man. Marvel decided to present a counter offer to Sony. How would they like to have all of their remaining characters for... $25 million. In the book The Big Picture, The Fight for the Future of Movies by Ben Fritz, he recounts how the Sony executives, including producer Amy Pascal, who has worked on all the MCU Spidey films, told Marvel that no one gave a shit about any of the other characters and they only wanted Spider-Man. It's hard to conceive now, when the last Avengers movie earned nearly $2.8 billion, but Marvel was willing to sell off their film rights for all of those characters for about one-eighth of the budget of that single movie. Can you imagine what that would have looked like? A world where Sony had access to all of Marvel's characters? I don't think that they would have had the guts or the vision to make a cinematic universe, for instance. I just can't see Sony having committed to, say, an Ant-Man movie. No, instead I think we would have gotten a lot of Spider-Man reboots, if I'm being honest. 
And of course, Marvel would have only had about $25 million to show for all their efforts. It's inconceivable that they would have then sold themselves to Disney for $4 billion. No, I think a world where Marvel had done that deal and only had revenues from licensing and the comics themselves would have resulted in a much, much smaller organization than the one we know today. Before I leave you, I want to plug a couple things. I want to turn your attention to a good deal on Humble Bundle that's up for the next few weeks. Dynamite Publishing is offering over 60 of their comics, like The Boys and Red Sonja, for just $25. And they're raising profits for the World Kitchen. That's a great charity that helps feed people in need throughout the world. Also, some of you may be interested in a gallery event in the Los Angeles County area. Gallery Nucleus has a show starting on July 15th, featuring Japanese artist Nanako Yashiro, whose work is pretty heavily influenced by shoujo manga. And hey, as long as we're plugging things, I'll plug myself. If you want more content, I always do a live show for about two hours on Monday afternoons. That's on my second channel, Pros and Cons, link in the description below. I do reviews of the comics that I've read that week and riff on the news of the week as it relates to comics. It's a really fun show where I get to interact with you, the viewer. So I hope you'll consider checking that out as well. I've got another banger episode for Comic Tropes coming to you next week. So until then, I want you to keep reading comics. Thanks for watching this video. If you liked it, please consider hitting like and subscribe. If you'd like to support the show, there are merchandise links beneath the YouTube video, and you can always hit join on YouTube or visit Comic Tropes on Patreon to get access to special perks.